Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bryce Wakefield, and I am the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Um, and it's been a difficult week, and I think we all know the gist of events by now. Last Thursday, February, February 14, uh, sorry, 24, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered special military operations in Ukraine. What to any objective observer is an invasion of Ukraine's sovereign territory, and thus a clear breach of international laws of war has been portrayed by the Russian government as an attempt to liberate Russian speakers in the territories of Donetsk, Don Donetsk and Luhansk in Ukraine's eastern region. Any notion that this was a humanitarian intervention has been belied by Russian troops entering Ukraine from the south and through Belarus, uh, through the north, as well um, as, as marching on other Ukrainian cities, including uh, notably the cap capital Kiev. Russia, Russia has of course met stiff resistance and by all credible reports is escalating the conflict. Putin has put his nuclear forces on high alert and last night, um, Australian time, the media were reporting that Russia may, for example, um, have started using thermobaric weapons against military targets. So destructive are these weapons that if they were used on civilian populations, it would be considered um, a, uh, an infraction of international humanitarian law. Obviously, however, the conflict in Ukraine has already resulted in a humanitarian tragedy, with the BBC reporting a few hours ago close to 700,000 refugees from Ukraine fleeing to Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary and Moldova. Many Ukrainians, however, have chosen or have been ordered indeed to stay and fight the invasion. In his State of the Union address just now, um, US President Joe Biden has commended the Ukrainian people defending their country, criticized and condemned, indeed, um, Vladimir Putin. However, um, he has reaffirmed, um, while well, reaffirming the, the US commitment to defending NATO countries, um, he has noted also that the US is not going directly into Ukraine to fight. There's much more to come in this conflict, and you can rest assured that as we do regular events at the AIIA in our mission to engage um, the Australian public in discussion and dialogue on international affairs, we'll be running more of these sessions as the conflict unfolds. For now, however, we wanted to address some of the very big picture questions. Um, first up, um, we're going to be looking at um, at our understandings of the nuclear aspects of this conflict. How do our current understanding and theories about the way that nuclear armed states behave in wartime explain what's going on? To discuss this issue, we have Associate Professor Maria Ross Rubley from Monash University. Hi, Maria. Hi there. Now, Maria has worked with the US intelligence community and advising them on nuclear policy. She's an international relations scholar whose work interrog interrogates the social construction of national security, including nuclear politics, maritime security, and diversity in security studies. She's been supported by a number of governments in her work and her book, Non-Proliferation Norms, Why States Choose Nuclear Restraint, uh, received the Alexander George Book Award for Best Book in Political Psychology. She's held a number of other titles and received another, a number of um, other awards. Um, but one of the, the best titles I think she's had was that she was on my PhD uh, examination committee and awarded me my PhD. So great to see you here, Maria. Next, we'll have Ben Zala to talk on how this conflict will affect relations between the great powers. Good to see you again, Ben. Bryce, thanks for having me back. Good. Um, ben is a research fellow in the Department of International Relations at the Australian National University. His work focuses on theoretical and historical approaches to the politics of the great powers and the management of nuclear weapons. In 2018 to 2019, Ben was a Stanton Junior Faculty Nuclear Security Fellow at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs in the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. 
And finally, we'll have Matthew Sussex on what this conflict means for Russia and the Putin regime. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Bryce. So Matthew, or Matt, is an adjunct uh, associate professor at Griffith University. He was previously associate professor and the academic director at the National Security College at the ANU. His main research specialization is on Russian foreign and security policy, um, and um, he's particularly interest in, interested in contemporary trends and violent conflict, especially in hybrid warfare and in the evolution of propaganda. Matthew's recent, recent solo collaborative book projects include Eurasian Integration, Central Asia and the New Politics of Energy, Power Politics and Confrontation in Eurasia, Violence and the State, and Conflict in the Former USSR. He was also, I'm, I'm pleased to say, but, but somewhat sorry to say, I haven't actually met him in person yet, he was also the president uh, of the Australian Institute of International Affairs Tasmania branch. So um, before we get started, the usual Zoom rules apply. Please type your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, and the upvote is enabled. So if you see a question you like, click the thumbs up button. And the questions with the most, most thumbs will float to the top of the pack, where I will choose to deal with them or not. Uh, be civil, because we're all about civil debate and discussion here at the AIIA. And if you want more civil debate and discussion, be sure to check out our events section of our website, internationalaffairs.org.au, internationalaffairs.org.au, and sign up also as a member of the AIIA. Um, we are a member organization, and we have a veritable plethora of events, um, some 150 to 200 per year, including, of course, um, in-person events, and these are either available for free or for a heavy discount for members. Um, and uh, we are based, um, it's actually official, I can make this announcement today, we're now based in every state and ter territory capital city in Australia. We've just approved the accession, if you like, of a Northern Territory branch. So that's a, good, a bit of good news today amidst all the doom and gloom. Um, but now we will turn back to the more serious fair, I guess, with um, Maria. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Bryce. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. And thank you to, to all the participants um, you know, there's a lot to say about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, you know, we've seen in the past few days, Russia has embarrassed themselves militarily, united NATO and Europe against Russia in, in a way many people thought was never possible. We've seen increased commitments to um, um, increasing defense spending in Europe in ways we haven't, wouldn't expect. We've seen countries departing from longstanding policies of neutrality, We've seen crippling trade sanctions levied. Um, you know, there's a lot that has happened in the, in the past few days and a lot that we can talk about. But I wanted to focus in particular on the nuclear side because a lot has been happening. Um, and, and, you know, I have a lot to say about what's happening, you know, in Ukraine and between, um, you know, Russia, NATO and the US, but there's also implications for Australia, significant implications for, for Australia. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. So. So on the nuclear side, before Putin even invaded Ukraine, he began by making veiled threats about nuclear use, about it. If, if countries tried to stop what they were doing, they would see, you know, responses like, you know, the world has never seen. Um, but, but once the conflict started and, you know, Putin, you know, the Russian forces made far less progress than expected. Um, in fact, it's come out that one of the Russian media accidentally published something that was due out on February 26, just two days after, you know, heralding, you know, the liberation of Ukraine, you know, this was expected to happen very quickly, and it didn't happen quickly. And, and that's really important to understand that right now Putin feels under tremendous domestic pressure because of the, you know, um, the terrible progress of basically his, you know, this is his baby here, you know, um, you know, retaking Ukraine, bringing it back, making it Russian again. Um, and so that really, you know, helps us understand why Putin has since then made um, a much more open nuclear threat. 
So he told his top defense and military officials to put nuclear forces in a special regime of combat duty. And this is an unusual phrase. This is not a typical phrase that you know would be used that we knew immediately what it meant. Um, but but since that's come out, we've come to understand that you know Russia has a number of, read, of readiness levels, just like the U.S. The U.S. has DEFCON levels. These um, readiness levels at the at the lowest level is constant, um, and at the top is number four. It's called full, and so um, this essentially um, this order by Putin it took them from level number one to level number two, which is elevated. And so you know that's that's good news. I mean, you know, people you know initially we didn't know what it meant. Did this take you know take them to the top of their DEFCON level? However. You know, even though it's only going from level one to level two, what it does mean, and we've seen speculation on this, and since then it's been confirmed by some Russian um, defense officials that essentially at level one, um, there a, a nuclear the order for nuclear attack cannot happen because there are physical components in the ordering system that are separated, and so at level two elevated, which is what where we're at now this order can take place. Those physically separated elements are put together so that an order can actually be processed. And so what this does, it makes um, it makes the system less vulnerable to decapitation in the event that, you know, there's concern about, you know, um, you know, there's an incoming, you know, nuclear strike. Um, of course, Putin is not worried about an incoming nuclear strike here. Putin is using this as a, um, you know, as a way to make veiled threats about, uh, you know, what, what Russia might do if, if um, he's not allowed to have his way, essentially. And so this actually is a significant change in the Russian nuclear status and, and one that we need to worry about. And I also want to say this is a very unusual threat. Um, Russia, since it's, it became the Russian Federation in the 90s, has not issued a threat like this, has not given an order like this publicly. And so it, it, is, it is a big deal. Um, even, even you know, under you know, during the Cold War, the former Soviet Union, we very rarely heard speak like this. So, this is this is a big threat. I mean, Putin said this knowingly, knowing it would resonate in that way. And so, the question is, what's the actual prospect of nuclear use? Um, I mean, on the one hand, it's a, it's very good that the U.S. did not react you know, this, to this inflammatory language with in kind language. The U.S. essentially said, you know, we're not changing our nuclear status. We're able to protect ourselves. And, um, and so, you know, so because there is real danger for escalation, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But, you know, I would say the, the likelihood of deliberate nuclear use is still very low. And so, you know, for people who are worried, are we going to see a nuclear war? I believe the likelihood is still quite low here. Um, but it is there, and it's it's not an insignificant risk when you think about, even though the probability may be low, the impact would be great. And I think the most likely type of nuclear use would be um, a tactical tactical nuclear use in Ukraine. Tactical nuclear weapons are have smaller yield. And they're meant, you know, to be uh, fired at short range. And we know that there are nuclear capable missiles in Belarus now. They can move there. Um, we don't know if the nuclear weapons have been moved there or not, but um, we do know that Belarus has said they're they're applying to remove their non-nuclear status, which is unclear. Are they withdrawing from the nuclear non-proliferation treaty? We're not exactly clear on that, but um, in any case, you know, one, you know, if, if Putin wanted to ha have some, a message here, an unmissable message, because he feels, you know, the, the crippling sanctions you know, the terrible progress um, his country, you know, his, his army has made, the increased, um, you know, concern by Russian citizens about what's happening, increased unhappiness at home. If he wanted to find a way to break a stalemate, one, you know, um, tactical nuclear uh, missile launched and, you know, potentially, in, you know, a less occupied area of Ukraine, basically to send a message that I mean business, that could happen. And I think that's the most likely thing that could happen, um, basically to, to try and break the resolve of, of NATO to discourage Ukrainian um, citizens from their resistance. And so, you know, if this were to happen, I mean, there'd be a number of tremendous effects. I think actually 
the blowback would be tremendous against Russia. Um, right now we have something, it's called the nuclear taboo. And it's, it's informal, but nuclear weapons have not been used since the US used them against, Hirosh against Japan, dropping them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. And so to violate this taboo would be astonishing. I mean, countries around the world, I mean, for a long time, you know, there's debates about disarmament, why aren't countries disarming? And, and really there's this pacifying message that's given that don't worry, we only have them for deterrence, we will never use them. And if there's nuclear use, that's going to shock, you know, shock everyone. Actually, these weapons can be used. Um, and the, 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 you know, if we think the sanctions against Russia are tough now, if there was nuclear use, it, it would look like child's play. Um, you know, the environmental and health consequences would be devastating. You know, it's difficult for me to say, you know, how many people would be killed or, you know, how would this, you know, would the radiation cloud, you know, affect Europe? I mean, there's a lot of variables in, you know, the target, if it's an air burst versus ground burst, if it's, you know, where it is, you know, the weather pattern. So it's hard to answer, you know, all those things, but, you know, lives would be lost, there'd be environmental devastation, and you can't limit the impact of nuclear devastation by space. You know, this stuff um, spreads and, you know, this would affect, um, you know, European, you know, countries and, you know, inevitably this, you know, it, it basically spreads around the atmosphere and it increases radiation for Australia as well. So I think the more important issue here, the more likely issue is, is that, you know, we have right now active war among active nuclear power plants, which were not designed for this purpose. And so if, for example, if a missile accidentally or on purpose hit a nuclear power plant in Ukraine, we could see um, a, a tremendous nuclear disaster like Chernobyl, like Fukushima, that could spread radiation much more so than, um, than one tactical nuclear um, weapon being, uh, being used. So, you know, there's a lot of concern about, you know, what might happen in terms of nuclear disaster because of Russia's invasion. And I just wanna spend the, my last minute or here to talk about what are the larger lessons? Well, in um, you know, the theory about sort of nuclear theories, theorizing, there's something called the stability instability paradox. And the idea is, is that when, you have, when countries have nuclear weapons, we can assume they're not going to attack each other because of mutually assured destruction, MAD. You know, if Russia attacks the US, the US will in turn, the US has second strike capability, it can, it can launch a second strike, even if it's hit um, with nuclear weapons and Russia will be very sorry they did that. And so basically that keeps them at bay, but it can create this room at lower levels for more, you know, making trouble because, you know, your countries feel sure that, you know, well, we're not gonna have a major war because we're too afraid, we're all frightened of a major nuclear war. And so we can do things at these lower levels. And, and certainly, I think that this is part of what's playing into Putin's confidence in, um, you know, in the invasion here. The problem is, is that, you know, MAD is actually MAD. Like, it's, this is insanity. The idea that, you know, we're threatening, um, you know, basically life on Earth as we know it, um, and hoping that there's not nuclear accidents or inadvertent use or an overconfident, um, you know, politician, which I think Putin would fit at that very well, um, you know, there is real concern about, you know, accidental or deliberate use that could, you know, lead to miscalculations, inadvertent escalation, and that's something that we all should be worried about. And I want to encourage all of the listeners to say, you know, why are we tolerating these, you know, numbers of nuclear weapons? There's about, you know, 14,000 nuclear weapons today. Granted, we're about 80% you know, less than the, at the height of the Cold War, but, um, and we can't get rid of these things slowly. Even if you aren't a proponent of nuclear disarmament, we can still reduce nuclear risks. And what we've seen in the past four or five years is countries starting to modernize their nuclear weapon programs. We've seen countries increase their nuclear weapons. Um, for example, the UK has just come out um, in the past year and said, we're gonna increase the number of nuclear weapons that we have. Why? What are, what are you doing here? I mean, this is something we should feel outraged about because frankly, you know, there's been modeling done by, by scientists saying, 
if there was even a small nuclear exchange, it could affect Earth's climate so significantly that it could plunge us into a mini ice age and we'd have 2 billion people at risk of dying of starvation from one small nuclear exchange. So, it, you know, this is time for Australians who typically have taken a, a big lead in this area. You know, we sort of punch above our weight, if you excuse me using the phrase, you know, on, on non-proliferation disarmament issues, but elsewhere that, you know, whether you're committed to nuclear disarmament or not, or think it's achievable, there are six significant things that can be done to reduce these nuclear risks. And in the past four or five years, we have, they've been basically abandoned. And we need to say, you know, for the sake of, of life, um, life on earth, we need to return to those and make nuclear use less likely. Thanks very much. All right, uh, thanks very much, Maria. So next to talk about um, great power relations is Ben Zala. Russ, okay, so um, I've been asked to sort of put the, the current conflict in, a, in, in the context of wider great power relations. Um, so I'm gonna start with the general and then end with the particular in that regard. But before I do so, uh, let me just start by noting that obviously the immediate effects the really important impacts uh, are, of course, felt by innocent Ukrainians who have had their country illegally invaded by a neighbouring great power. That's where the impacts are today. Through these wider implications in trying to put this into a, a larger context, I think this is really important because uh, it helps us to avoid having this conflict thinking through these things helps us to avoid this conflict escalating into a much wider and more destructive one, potentially even going down some of those uh, nuclear paths that Maria was just talking about. So therefore to think about the general uh, observations we can make at this stage. Well, the first I think is that if there was any doubt about Russia's role, whether we like it or not, as a pole in a multipolar order, in other words, a distribution of power with multiple poles of power, or to use the more common parlance, a great power, one of the great powers in a multipolar order, then I think its actions recently have put any uh, doubt to an end. Its, brinks, its brinkmanship, uh, I think its ability to dominate the international agenda, to sort of suck that international attention, um, its willingness to just outright ignore the wishes of the United States, which was the, the state that up until recently we thought of as the unipole, the unipolar order, right? The, the superpower, uh, the hedge, the term you wanted to call it. I think all confirms the sense that a number of us have had for some time of a return to an actually historically relatively familiar distribution of power, a multipolar distribution. And as I said, I'll talk about the individual poles in that order, particularly Russia, China, and the US in just a minute. But what's important to note is that the war in Ukraine is not the wars in Europe that we saw in the 1990s, in which the US and its allies uh, in strategic terms were really the only game in town in terms of bringing external force to bear on those conflicts. And Russia, though obviously still important to you know, conflicts like uh, Bosnia and Kosovo, ultimately looked on played a less consequential role as a former great power. I think that's changed. Second point in general is that the events so far, and I really do have to underline so far, it is very early on in this, right? So it's just trying to draw some immediate. They point to an era, I think, in which uh, this era of great power politics, or what some refer to as the return of great power politics, they're actually likely to resemble the great power politics of the past in important ways. And that in some ways is reassuring and in, in other ways not because the history of great power politics on the whole is not a, a cheery one, um, but at least there is a degree of familiarity here. We have managed some of these tensions and crises and security concerns in the past. So for example, great powers will still claim special rights. They will still try to act differently to the rest of the international system and act accordingly. And this is in line with quite literally centuries of great power behavior. So in other words, we may deplore Russian actions. I happen to, I assume many of you do as well, but there isn't anything unusual in great power terms about this. 
In fact, it's not even a novel phenomenon in recent history. So even in the unipolar era, when there was just that one pole of power, the United States, it still claimed special rights and acted accordingly. Um, and in, this also extended to uh, viewing a particular sovereign state uh, as a threat, doing a threat assessment and saying, I think there's a problem here and invading its sovereign territory. Uh, in that case, not on its own, but in a coalition, including Australia, such was the power and influence of the US at the time, and conduct invasion illegally without UN Security Council authorization. Now, of course, I'm talking about Iraq in 2003. Now, I want to be really clear here, I am not, repeat not, drawing a moral equivalence between the two. It doesn't in any way make Russia's invasion of Ukraine now any less unjust or any less deplorable, but it tells us that it's not particularly unusual great power behavior, even in recent terms. Russia as a great power, if you use that lens, it makes sense, it puts it in context. The other aspect of the whole crisis, not just the invasion, but the crisis leading up to it as well, that is fairly familiar in great power terms, um, is that Russia, like all great powers before it, including its own history of, of holding that status, still seek what we refer to, or at least used to refer to, as spheres of influence. Now that term has sort of become a bit of a dirty word in polite society. It's not something we like to talk about anymore, spheres of influence. It feels very old fashioned, quite outdated. We like to tell ourselves that we don't live in that world anymore. We like the, to think of uh, the modern contemporary international system as slowly but surely becoming more egalitarian perhaps even more rules-based. But actually, the practice of spheres of influence, maintaining them, establishing them, never really went away. So the United States, for example, during the unipolar era, re more recently, say the last 30 years or so, hasn't had to work very hard to keep its sphere of influence in Central and, and much of South America. And that led some to think that the US didn't have a sphere of influence, that we were past all of that. We'd reached a more enlightened age. But just ask yourself, if there was, say, a Chinese-backed or even a Russian-backed alliance system in Latin America that had expanded northwards in successive waves of uh, membership inclusion, the United States would just sit back and let it happen and take no actions. Would it do nothing when Mexico, right on its border, for example, uh, started to drift politically towards that external backer, towards those states, had an official desire that it stated that it wanted to join the alliance and that the alliance would refuse to rule out any future membership for Mexico. So it wouldn't rule in or out any, anyone joining the alliance. Do we honestly think that the United States wouldn't be taking action? Of course it would, right? It'd be very natural for it to do so because the United States maintains a sphere of influence in its neck of the woods, like all other great powers. What we see with the return of Russia, even if only in its own eyes to great power status, is a return for a, or a desire to return to a world of spheres of influence. And what is exceptionally clear is that it sees Ukraine, a state right along its border, as being within its sphere of influence. Spheres of influence, unfortunately, again, whether we like it or not, whether it's just or not, whether it's something we want to see in world politics, they are real. Great powers will fight to the death to establish them and maintain them because, as I said, rightly or wrongly, they see them as integral to their own survival. But importantly, we should also note that if recognised and respected by other great powers, Spheres of influence can help avert great power or major wars. When great powers recognise each other's spheres, it can help avert wars. They aren't necessarily the great evil that they're often thought to be, but they do result in sacrificing the independence and the autonomy of smaller states, especially those that are geographically adjacent to a great power. They're therefore, by definition, unjust and unfair but they can also save lives. I think it's time to start getting used to the concept again. I think in part, uh, the terminology doesn't help. I actually think uh, in modern great power terms, less in terms of spheres of influence, wanting to influence what goes on inside that state, uh, and more in terms of spheres of exclusion, simply wanting to exclude 
what great powers view as other hostile powers just relates to Ukraine. I actually happen to think it relates to Russia's approach to Georgia. I think it happens to relate to uh, China's approach to much of its immediate region and so forth. And as I said, I think it relates to how the United States approaches much of its own immediate region. I think it's time to get used to these terms once again and start to really think through how are we going to deal with and manage the politics of spheres of influence in the modern age. I don't think we can just wish it away. In fact, I think Russia has shown us quite brutally that that is the case. Um, I'll just say a few words about specifically in terms of the individual powers themselves, uh, how I think this is playing out or what it, it might tell us about um, very, very contemporary great power politics. In terms of, let's start with Russia. Um, I think what it tells us that, well, it, in other words, it confirms what we already knew about Russia, which is that it really only has a few uh, serious power resources to fall back on, to sort of call on in its great power politics, but that it is willing to use them. So that is on the one hand, natural resources, oil and gas mainly, and on the other, particularly important currently, is military power. It is one of the major military powers in the world, including its nuclear forces. The other thing that itself has learned is that despite the fact that we in the West like to say that when we talk about others, including Russia, but also including China and other states like Iran or North Korea, that they only understand the language of force. It's a very common phrase we see being used. Well, I think what Russia has learned is actually that we too only understand the language of force. For years, no one would speak to the Russians seriously about NATO expansion. We held this line that, I'm saying we, as in the West, the NATO members, held the line of, NATO expansion isn't up for discussion. We will include or not include anyone we like. It's not up to you, Russia. And it wasn't until Russia amassed 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border that anyone started having discussions about this seriously. Look at the op-ed pages of the newspapers now, and people are having a genuine discussion about was NATO expansion serious or not. So they've learned that we're also the only ones who, who understand the language of force. That Russian actions, I want to be really clear. Right? They didn't have to then use force to make their point. But we have told them that we ignored them for years. And when they brought force to bear, all of a sudden we're willing to discuss things. In terms of the United States, I think it's struggled to let go of that unipolar mindset quite understandably. Uh, hence, it couldn't openly and plainly accept those Russian concerns over NATO expansion for a long time uh, and just rule out further NATO expansions on Russia's border. But I think what we're seeing currently is that it's learning to adjust to these new multipolar circumstances. It did offer in the lead up to this conflict some concessions on NATO, not membership, but in terms of military exercises uh, and deployments. And I think importantly, as Maria mentioned, it didn't respond in kind to Russia's nuclear signaling. Finally, uh, China, I think, as many have noted, is sort of between a rock and a hard place on this. Um, the crisis and subsequent invasion, to some extent, plays into China's hands. It demonstrates that any lingering illusions about a US led unipolar order uh, are all over. It also helps shift the Biden administration's sole focus on China uh, away, which uh, gives it some breathing room. But of course, Russia's actions in recognizing two breakaway provinces in a sovereign state and then committing military force to protect those provinces uh, is literally the great nightmare scenario for China vis-a-vis -vis its own potentially breakaway provinces, particularly Taiwan. So if an external power, i.e. the United States, recognized Taiwanese independence and then used military force to protect, to you know, ensure that independence stayed that way, that is the concern, that's the, the worry that we all have about a war over Taiwan. So China is in this sort of awkward position. On the one hand, not terribly um, unhappy about seeing the Russians really push American power out of Europe, but on the other, the precise nature of this conflict has really put China in a very awkward position. I think of their relationship with Russia as less of a positive kind of alliance with and more of a, a sort of a negative, almost a, um, a non-aggression pact of, of old, where they just stay out of each other's business. And I think that will likely uh, remain the case for some time. So I'll leave my comments there. Thanks, Bryce. Thank you, Ben. There's uh, much uh, food for thought there. Um, but before we get on to Q&A, we'll go to Matthew Sussex. Um, for what um, the conflict will mean for Putin and Russia. 
Terrific. Thanks, Bryce. And great to see so many uh, people in the audience. Absolutely fantastic and uh, difficult as well for me to follow two class acts like Maria and Ben, but uh, I shall do my best and probably do very poorly. Um, I'll spend my time uh, talking very briefly, because Ben's largely covered it, uh, about what Putin wants in Ukraine and why he wants it. Um, focus more specifically on how it's going for him. Um, short answer, not very well. Um, and, uh, and then spend the remainder of my time having a look at some of the implications. What does this mean for, for Putin himself? What does it mean for Russia? What does it mean for the future of Ukraine and, and the sort of European security order? Um, but before I do, um, it's re instructive, I think, to recall that when Putin first came to, uh, to office, to the presidency, a long time ago now, back in the year 2000, uh, he had one simple promise. And that simple promise to the Russian people was, I'm going to restore uh, Russian greatness. I'm going to turn Russia back into a great power. This, uh, And of course, uh, the Russians have a word for this, you know, a word that means thinking and acting like a great power. And the word is derzhavnost. Uh, and it's something that Russians way back in 2000, it seems a long time ago now, um, were, were really worried about, were concerned that they had become upper volta with ballistic missiles, that they were uh, you know, in a, in a state that had no future, that was economically riven, that was socially dysfunctional, that was politically led by, uh, by inept leaders. Then that was Putin's promise, Dejavnost. Um, in terms of invading Ukraine, uh, there are two stories as to, to why he has done what he's done. The first story, as Ben has covered, is that this is Russia responding to uh, decades of being ignored, decades of being marginalized in the European security order, decades of NATO saying, well, we're a collective security organization and uh, you know, everybody's welcome to join with the exception of Russia. Uh, you can perhaps have a voice in the organization, but not a veto. Um, and, uh, and the notion is that, that, that Russia has been you know, shoved aside, that it has legitimate security concerns. The other view on why Putin has gone into Ukraine um, is that this is the realization of a, uh, something that's become quite personal uh, for him. It's certainly the case, I think, that since he has been in power, Putin has made a transition from a sort of pragmatic nationalist uh, to one you can probably identify as a really ultra-nationalist in terms of the way that his rhetoric takes shape and the way that he speaks and the types of language that he uses. Um, he wrote uh, an essay last year, or apparently wrote an essay, it's certainly available on the Russian president's website if it's not currently being hacked by the Ukrainians or by Anonymous, um, in which he said that Ukrainians do not have the right to exist as a sovereign people uh, or as a sovereign state that Russians and Ukrainians are the one people. They're united and they've been divided uh, for many, many years by Western meddling and particularly by NATO. Uh, that NATO poses uh, a clear threat through Ukraine uh, to Russian territorial integrity. Um, I, uh, I think that this uh, characterization by Putin uh, that does speak to uh, a less rational actor in the Kremlin than ordinarily we would assume uh, when we look at classic models of, of, of rational actor theory. Um, it is weaponizing uh, tropes about identity politics, about Russia as a unifying civilizational influence, a sort of third Rome that brings all sorts of different people together. Uh, but in order to do so, Russia must be a great power uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a prominent strand in the discourse in Russian foreign uh, foreign policy and national security thinking. So that's the the other side of the story, of course, as to why he has gone into Ukraine is because he simply wants to enlarge Russia's geopolitical footprint, not to replace the USSR. Certainly not in ideological terms. Putin has said on numerous occasions that uh, anyone. Uh, who uh, didn't lament the passing of the USSR has no soul. 
but then always, uh, but then follows it up, followed it up with anyone who thinks it can return has no brain. He has, I think, managed in the first part of his war against Ukraine to achieve two things. If in fact we take it as read that this is what he wants to do, that he wants to in some way enlarge Russia's power, enlarge large Russia's real estate or capacity to utilize that real estate for military security purposes. Uh, he has managed on the one hand to uh, effectively turn Belarus into a client state. In fact, he achieved that last year with the sham uh, elections and re revolts against sham elections. Uh, in Belarus and uh, provided a great deal of help to Lukashenko. Uh, now, of course, uh, he has 30,000 troops in Belarusian territory, those that aren't in Ukraine at the moment, uh, and has also uh, been instrumental in Minsk, uh, passing a referendum that says uh, Belarus uh, abandons nuclear neutrality and might in fact uh, host nuclear weapons on its territory, which enables uh, Russia to expand its, uh, its A2AD envelope uh, further westwards, uh, which is a worrying thing. The second thing he's managed to accomplish uh, in terms of his, his overall aims is that uh, in Ukraine itself, he has probably managed uh, to secure at the very least uh, a type of um, situation where you will have eventually two Ukraines. Um, as the absolute best result for, for Ukraine and, and for the West. Uh, you will probably have a, a rump Ukraine, um, which is perhaps, you know, west of the Dnieper, uh, probably not including Kiev. Um, Putin will eventually, you think, take it. Um, and, uh, and an eastern part that is ruled by a puppet, friendly to Moscow, including Donetsk, Luhansk, uh, and Crimea as well, the so-called Crimean Corridor, extending out towards Mariupol. However, beyond that, uh, I think the war for Putin is going very badly, and I think he has made three misjudgments. His first misjudgment uh, was that he thought he would win quickly and cleanly. He obviously tried to use uh, lightly armoured troops, uh, shock, uh, swift, swift capturing of Ukrainian airfields near Kiev to decapitate the leadership of Zelensky, uh, and uh, in uh, failing to do that, the attack being beaten back uh, by Ukrainian armed forces, it not, not only bought Kiev time, but it also allowed Zelensky to, to become something of a hero. Um, he has utilized the information battle space extraordinarily well, um, making sure that he refers to we, you know, we Ukrainians are fighting uh, to try and bring in Europeans. We are European. We need your help, etc. Whereas Putin, on the other hand, has focused very much on I. I am doing this. I have a limited objective, limited set of objectives in Ukraine, uh, and all of the uh, the messaging from Moscow is just pictures of of, of Putin in Rococo palaces. Um, so, uh, so that's the first miscalculation that uh, that Putin made, that uh, he could win quickly and cleanly. The second miscalculation he made, I think, is the strength of the Western response. I don't think that he was expecting that the West would go for export controls that would block banks, that would uh, freeze uh, assets, uh, freeze and possibly seize assets is uh, what the US is talking about now. Um, and uh, and it, it put in very, very tight controls on uh, the Russian central bank. Uh, this is a sanctions package that is, is well beyond what we anticipated was going to be likely and almost definitely Putin as well. His calculation for many years has been that the West is fragmented, weak, supine, will not respond in a united way, will simply want problems to go away and kick the can down the road. So he's misjudged that. His third misjudgment, I think, also has been in terms of uh, the potential implications for what happens, the fact that he clearly has had no plan B. Um, he has um, put stakes an awful lot of credibility, I think, on this uh, idea that he will win quickly uh, and easily in Ukraine. Um, and as a result, he is being forced to fall back on the uh, more typical uh, area of, uh, of, of sort of strength in the Russian military playbook. Um, and that is to uh, cut off troop formations, enemy troop formations, surround them, kettle them 
but also to surround cities and lay siege to them with unguided munitions to just bomb the hell out of them, the sort of Grozny Mark II, but on steroids uh, approach that he seems to be uh, starting now. Um, and in doing so, uh, he, of course, guarantees himself uh, three things. One, he guarantees that there will be a Ukrainian resistance as long as uh, Russian forces remain uh, on Ukrainian territory. I think the second thing he guarantees is that uh, the that Russia has effectively exited the West uh, to all intents and per all intents and purposes. Um, the amount of uh, unity within the West extends not just to sanctions, but of course things like Germany saying it's going to spend a hundred billion uh, more rubles on its defence. The, the notion that Finland and Sweden might end up joining NATO. Um, paradoxically, uh, an implication of Putin's war in Ukraine is that he makes the alliance structures that he chose and sought to weaken for so many years actually stronger, that this is a wake-up call for the West that they have finally responded to. And the third implication, I think, just in the short amount of time that's uh, left to me, um, the third implication, I think, for Putin that he's, he's kind of you know, not really thought about is what does this mean for him and his, his rule? Putin is terrified of colour revolutions. He's terrified that ordinary Russians will rise up and say enough's enough, drag him out of the Kremlin um, the, in a sort of Gaddafi scenario. And in fact, he has, has uh, privately remarked to others that this is something that terrifies him or alternatively being shoved aside by his inner clique. And that's, of course, why he's played divide and rule with them for so many years. Uh, I think the situation he has created for himself in Ukraine is one in which he has no easy outs. The outcomes for Putin are going to be bad, whatever happens. If he is forced to lay siege to Ukrainian cities um, and eventually extract some concessions, um, it's going to reflect very poorly on him as a wartime leader. The sanctions are going to reflect very poorly on him as someone who can manage Russia's economic greatness. Uh, in fact, you know, as we know, mortgages have gone or interest rates have gone from 9.5% to 20% overnight. This is going to have real implications for Russian people. I'm not saying, going to say, saying that they'll get out on the streets uh, in large numbers because they are terrified of Putin, just as his inner clique is terrified of him. But the longer this goes on, the worse it gets for them. The trouble with that is, of course, that if Putin sees that he has no viable or no good off-ramps, then he may well choose to do what he has done typically when under pressure, and that is to gamble uh, and go for the high-risk scenario, something perhaps that, you know, some of the things that Maria was alluding to, um, perhaps escalate the conflict in Ukraine, but also try and provoke NATO, uh, as a way of justifying his message that, look, NATO was right, or sorry, I was right all along about the evils of NATO expansion and the evils uh, of Ukraine being a bunch of fascists in league with them. Um, that is the real concern. And I think that uh, one of the things people who are interested in this area need to do, uh, think very clearly and carefully about, is how do you provide Putin with an off-ramp that is acceptable to him that is acceptable to the Ukrainians who have fought extremely well uh, and captured uh, you know, the Western uh, attention and admiration, if not boots on the ground, uh, and also placate the West as well. And I'm not sure that we have a viable answer to that question. Um, in fact, uh, I think uh, everybody is going to have to compromise a great deal. Thanks very much. All right, thanks to all three of you. I will, um, uh, I will come to uh, your questions in the audience uh, in a second. Great to see so many of you here, and also great to see so many of the AIIA family. I'll, I'll just acknowledge uh, briefly that both our president, national president and national vice president, as well as a number of uh, state and territory branch presidents are uh, in the audience and fellows as well. It's great to see you all. So um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions first, though, and I guess my first question is to Ben, probably, well, probably you can all have a stab in it, but it does concern this notion of um, spheres of influence, which, uh, you know, is a very, a very cold war, um, or, or even a pre-cold war term. Um, and I just wonder, you know, to, to 
to be the sort of naive person who tilts at windmills and defends the rules-based international order, um, I just wonder if you might be speaking too soon a bit there, Ben, because um, to have spheres of influence, what you really need is client states. And there's no question that that Russia currently maintains spheres of influence over countries like Belarus, which are essentially, you know, Putin's lapdog. Um, but I mean, what we've seen in the Ukraine is a um, an idealistic um, fundamental attachment to the ideals, particularly of the European Union and the rules based international order. And it's been actually quite phenomenal. Um, to as as Matthew has already said to to watch um, to watch to watch the reaction to the extent that one might actually think that Putin um, Putin sold himself and the Russians on the notion that the um, the reaction to um, to um, was it um, to the reaction in 2014, the protests against the pro-Russian government in Maidan were simply sort of, you know, um, were pro-European plants, that this wasn't, this was sort of astroturf, if you like. But it seems to me that there is a real um, uh, civic nationalism um, uh, that has grown in, 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 the, in, in the Ukrainian people. And I don't think that can be wiped away overnight, as we've already seen. So, I mean, doesn't your theory kind of, I mean, doesn't it rest on, 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 on how this plays out? Are you not speaking a little bit too soon when you speak of spheres and influence? And I guess a related question to that would be, where do spheres of influence stop? I mean, at the risk of going full Munich on you, um, Russia has bits and pieces um, over Eastern Europe that um, that, that it supports. I'm thinking of areas like Transnistria in, in Moldova. Um, we've already seen, you know, South, uh, South Ossetia and, um, and Abkhazia and Georgia. Um, uh, uh, you know, if we don't stop them now, what's to, what's to say that we won't see an, an extension of those spheres of influence, if you like? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's a it's a, a really good devil's advocate question because it's the other side of this and it's the conventional wisdom, right? It's the conventional view, uh, particularly in this country, but all around the world that sphere, we can't give the likes of Putin or when we look at other cases, we can't give the likes of President Xi in China an inch because they'll take a mile, right? All sorts of reasons to be extremely sceptical, I think, of that view. And when we say, you know, um, what happens if we if we give these over? I would say, what happens if we don't ask the people of Ukraine right now? We're quite literally seeing what great powers who have the capability, right? Whether we whether we think it's just, unjust, whether it's in, in legal terms, legal or illegal, they have the capability to do it and they're doing it currently. They have the ability to fight for spheres of influences, to, to establish them and to maintain them. And as I said, there's nothing historically unusual about this. There's nothing unique to Putin. We don't need to get into Putin's mind to understand this. You need to look at the history of great power politics. If they didn't, if Russia said, you know what? Okay, we agree, you've won us over, rules-based order, spheres of influence are, is an outdated way of thinking about this. They would quite literally be historically unique in doing so. They'd be the first great power to say, we're okay with other great powers having forces right up on our border. We trust everyone. Uh, we don't fear the future. Um, we, we put our faith in you that you, you won't uh, go back on any promises. And isn't this a wonderful new rules-based order? Here we go. And we just know from centuries of history that's not how great powers think, unfortunately. And I think if we do the sort of like, you know, frankly, naive approach and say, well, let's just tell ourselves that our spheres of influence are good, they're bad, they should just know this and, and act accordingly. We're going to see more Ukraines. Frankly, we will see more conflict, we will see more displacement, we will see more death and destruction. So the question becomes, well, resisting the idea of spheres of influence at what cost? What are we willing, who are we willing to sacrifice to ensure that we have a perfectly egalitarian order and so forth. And when, as I said, when the challenge comes in the US sphere of influence in Latin, South and Central America, are we going to expect the United States to do the same thing to allow, you know, 
Mexico to align itself with China and, in, and accept a Chinese base or something, whatever it is, right? There's a good reason why the Americans spend a lot of time worrying about the growing Chinese influence in Latin America. So the question of where do they stop, you know, if we're giving this one, just take everything, I think it's putting the parameters in the wrong space. I think it's, it's taking a sort of an absolutist approach, which just won't make any compromises. It assumes that we don't have our own spheres of influence. So the, the key point to think about in terms of NATO expansion is we mustn't forget that there are five NATO member states that host US nuclear weapons on their soil. So if Ukraine becomes a member, there is nothing to stop Ukraine putting its hand up and saying, yeah, we'll take some. And there's nothing to stop NATO member states saying, yeah, it'd be good to put a few tactical nukes on Ukrainian soil. And we're asking the Russians to accept that on their soil. I think that's a really bad, dangerous move because I don't think the Russians will respond well to that. So I think spheres of influence, as I said, they are unjust, they are unfair. Uh, it means selling out smaller states. I mean, ask the people of Poland, right? The history of Poland is being divided up over and over again in different deals by the major powers. But we also know that when spheres of influence are tested or not accepted, think of something like the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the Soviets were saying, is this your sphere? Is, can we put missiles here? Are you sure? And the Americans said, absolutely not. We came very, very close to nuclear war. We know that if we don't take spheres of influence seriously, the result is death and destruction on a mass scale. So I think the Munich analogy thing just doesn't help us very much because I think it um, it results in warfare. And I don't think that's where we want to be headed. All right, very good. Um, or very depressing. Um, uh, uh, I, I have one more question and and it's to Maria and then we'll go to Q&A and um, it's Maria on the use of nuclear weapons in the Ukraine itself you said you know there is a possibility that um, nuclear weapons could tactical nukes could be deployed um, in Ukraine but um, I'm just wondering um, given that the, the the war aims of Russia is to win the war in Ukraine not uh not not to enter a full-scale nuclear war or anything like this they do have these they do have these very devastating thermobaric weapons which to my understanding has the same sort of impact on civilian populations as nukes do um it's a it's a terrible calculus to think about but is it more likely that they would would if they are going to i mean you've you've spent a lot of time working on the psychology of um nuclear weapons um it doesn't seem to me that there is any utility to using a nuclear weapon if your goal is essentially to demoralize and destroy um ukrainian capability it's more likely that russia will use other weapons such as such as this type rather than a, a tactical nuclear weapon um, the value of a tactical nuclear weapon is the messaging, and it's to say we are tearing up the rule book, we're tearing up the nuclear uh, taboo, and all bets are off. If you don't back off, then it's going to get ugly. And so, and no other type of weapon other than a nuclear weapon can send that message. And so, if Putin feels back into that much of a corner, then yes, he may he may do that. And so. That's what we have to be concerned about. And I agree with Matt completely that we have to be thinking about off ramps for Putin. And I mean, that's that's what everybody's thinking about. So it's, you know, we our policymakers aren't ignoring that. It's just there aren't very many. So and in that way, I would I would disagree with you, Ben. I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I, I disagree in terms of it doesn't matter who's running Russia. I think it matters a great deal and that the psychology of the leader makes a huge difference. And and I mean, Putin's approach to this um, is quite different than, you know, other, you know, leaders who might be there who are more bureaucratic, military oriented. Um, and, and so the ideology and worldview of Putin, Putin makes the use of nuclear weapons a lot more likely because his goals are so big. Um, and, and, and in the same way, you know, Z Zelensky, one of the questions was what's this tell us about our theory? I think it tells us that individuals matter a huge amount. The whole reason that Putin is in such bad straits right now is because Zelensky got on that phone call with the Western leaders and pleaded and said, we're here dying for your Western values. You've got to cut Russia off from SWIFT. And suddenly 
Germany, Italy, and other countries just all collapsed. I mean, you can read about the analysis of that and the emotional impact. And so I think that there's going to be a lot for us to glean from this. And, and I'm sure all, you know, I've said things that will end up being wrong here, but um, just my thoughts on it. Yep, fog of war type stuff, isn't it? Right. So um, uh, I, 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 I'll ask a question from the audience for for Matt, and it does relate to what we've just heard on Swift um, and also on um, psychology. I guess is um, to what effect are the sanction do the sanctions matter? So Elizabeth Buchanan um, has who people will know as an as um, an expert in this area as well has said that sanctions aim to shape a state behavior. Um, uh, and we have uh, various uh, companies like Maersk now boycotting the Russian market, as with Apple. Um, at what point, I mean, these are, of course, services that the Russian people use, not necessarily the oligarchs or Putin himself. At what point are we just punishing the Russian people? Does this not narrow avenues for de-escalation, Matt? Um, yes, it does. Absolutely. But of course, sanctions can be used in two ways. Sanctions can be used for deterrence. Uh, to try and stop leaders from doing bad things. And they can also be used to punish countries. Uh, sanctions, as we know, can be somewhat targeted, but they tend to be you know, often broad brush that will directly impact populations. And we've seen that everywhere from Iran to Iraq, everywhere else. And the question is often raised, is, are, are sanctions useful? You know, are, are they a good thing? <clears throat> Will they ultimately, uh, in their punishment phase, bring about changes in behaviour? Um, I think the, the point is not so much of, of all these sanctions is not so much to change Russia's behaviour. I think it's a realisation that uh, relations with Russia, uh, between Russia and the West, are going to just be conflictual in every domain. Uh, and one of the things that Russia has done especially well is to weaponize uh, trade uh, whether it's in London grad or whether it's in buying Italian, you know, uh, uh, leather shoes. Um, and this is saying, no, we're not going to put up with that. And uh, if uh, you think that, you know, you can um, establish gas monopolies over our countries, then, you know, we will, we will effectively isolate your people and isolate your country uh, economically, turn it into a pariah into the loving arms of the Chinese who will uh, extract, I think, enormous um, uh, enormous, well, if not glee, then enormous satisfaction uh, in the fact that uh, they, they can more or less turn Russia into a satrapy. Uh, so it is shaping behaviour, but it's shaping behaviour in a way that says, okay, enough is enough. We've kicked the can down the road for, for too long. Uh, okay, great. Zara Kempton, our uh, vice president, has um, an, uh, uh, an interesting question given... Um, uh, given that uh, the um, uh, we've seen we've seen a lot of gridlock at the UN, of course, with the um, with the vote to come to some sort of resolution on this issue vetoed by the Russians themselves, acting as the president of the Security Council at the time, she asks, "Can the UN play any useful role in defusing the situation, or is this just show, showing how useless it is in this day and age?" Um, and I guess uh, she, she does ask about the Security Council veto system, which should play into that, I guess. Who wants to take that one? Um, I can take it very briefly while everyone else thinks. Um, so is the UN particularly useful? No. Uh, can it play a role at the Security Council? Uh, not really. Um, and can we get rid of the veto? No. Um, so uh, it, it's one of the problems we have of, of you know, uh, international global governance that the UN is, is set up with this club of five uh, and getting rid of one of them uh, is, uh, is very, very difficult or enlarging it. You know, even the question of enlargement, we've been talking about that since, you know, well, before even the end of the Cold War. Uh, so, uh, so unfortunately, I think it's going to be major powers that lead on this. Any other uh, takers or is that... Uh... Just a quick vote for, I mean, in principle, I completely agree with Matt, but in principle, it's not impossible for UN agencies or actors associated with the UN, even an individual like the Secretary General, to engage in creative behind the scenes diplomacy to try and help facilitate those major power discussions. So I agree with Matt that ultimately great powers are going to have to negotiate this amongst themselves as they want to do because they have the ability to. But I wouldn't say that that 
means there's no role at all. I would say, Mr. UN Secretary General, you've got an important job to do yet. Yeah, and I'd like to just pop in. I agree, I agree with both Matt and Ben on that. And I would say, I mean, the UN does a lot of really important things. So I don't want people to walk away thinking the UN is worthless. I mean, on many, many issues, the UN does so much. But when you have two great powers coming head to head, there's very a lot of limits to what it could do. And I know people are talking about there may be a backlash um, against you know seeing the UN Security Council so hampered by this and that this will lead to a greater push for UN Security Council reform. But it's just, it's so hard to do and it's gonna require, how do you do it with Russia? <laughs> So, you know, so I, I think that that is, um, won't happen. Okay, um, we have a question here from Daniel Snyder. And if it's the Daniel Snyder, I know he's a long serving um, journalist, uh, was with the uh, Christian Science Monitor for a long time and, and now is at Stanford and a good friend. Um, and he wants to know a bit more about the regional implications. And I think by that he means Australia's region, or at least, you know, the Indo-Pacific, if you like. So Japan's response, we know that um, uh, uh, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has come out and um, uh, talked about the need for basing nuclear weapons on Japanese soil, and has also talked about the need for, he talks a lot about US policy, but not about Japan's policy, the need for US to drop its position of st strategic ambiguity. Um, ben, you have talked a bit about the lessons that the Chinese might take from this, but if you've got any more, would appreciate your views on this for Taiwan and beyond. And um, it might be a good idea to throw India in the mix as well. <laughs> it's a sort of large question, but if any uh, anybody wants to take a stab at it, um, please do so. Who wants to go first? If, if nobody, then Ben will have to Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have a quick run through because I, I already mentioned China, so I'll try and do that, add to that very quickly. Um, okay, so very quickly on Japan, yeah, I mean, it, it has uh, now joined um, other nations in um, economic sanctions. Uh, it's also committed, um, I think Kashida committed something like 100,000 or something, no, sorry, 100 million, um, uh, in uh, sort of humanitarian aid as well, um, equally important, right? Part of being realistic about what's going on is to say, yes, we're trying to financially strangle Russia and put the pressure on, but we also recognise that this is a huge humanitarian catastrophe. So there are things we can do with money and with refugee visas and things like that to help alleviate that, right? Um, but yes, it does seem that for Japan, this sharpens a few questions and all in fairly negative ways about what I'm talking about is this kind of drift well, no longer a drift sort of acceleration of a so called multipolar distribution of power where its major ally a bit like for Australia, the United States goes from being the only game in town to being one of the major powers, which means that it has to make compromises sometimes and that's going to be in ways that allies like Australia like Japan, like South Korea are not going to be hugely happy about. Uh, quite regularly. In terms of China and Taiwan, uh, when um, tensions really started to increase, a lot of people asked, um, you know, do you think China's going to make a move on Taiwan? They're going to use the opportunity. And my answer to that was unequivocal, absolutely not. The day that China takes action over Taiwan on a Russian timetable is the day that I don't know, I'll do something outrageous. I just don't see that happening. It's not to say that China won't um, take the opportunity to, to push the point a little bit more while attention is focused elsewhere, perhaps buzz Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese airspace a little more. In fact, that has already happened, but I mean, it was already happening. <laughs> it didn't need a Ukrainian crisis to do that, right? I think that the Chinese, so as I said, China's in this kind of funny position vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan on this because of um, Putin's excuse for doing what he wanted to do is recognizing breakaway regions of a sovereign state, which is obviously extremely sensitive territory for China. Um, but one of the things I think it will, we probably will see is China doing everything it can, it can to get off the dollar uh, in the years to come, because it's going to be looking very hard at, at these sanctions and the way they, they squeeze Russia and so forth. Uh, really quickly on India, India is in a, I mean, it's obviously a different circumstance, but a somewhat tricky position in that uh, Russia is a really, really important defence supplier for India. Um, so that in recent years, India has been willing to absorb 
Western pressure about certain arms sales. So, for example, India going ahead with buying S-400 um, anti-aircraft weapons, despite the fact that the Western states, particularly the US, have been very clear that they don't want so this puts India again in a very tricky position. It, it kind of needs Russia, uh, but it's not thrilled with with Russian action. I expect to see India trying to keep their head down and out of this uh, for some time. We're already seeing the disappointment of its fellow Quad members in India not taking a stronger stance um, in recent years. Okay, great. That that leads me right into my next question. Um... Uh, and it's from Bill Toe, who, of course, is an eminent uh, security specialist um, and was indeed, I think, the, uh, the research chair of this organization. So um, Bill's question is, has the Russia-Ukraine conflict highlighted the need to think about strategic deterrence differently within or outside an alliance context? And given India's and China's mutual abstentions on the UNSC or the UN Security Council resolution, are the assumptions underlying security, security cooperation via the Quad and other minilaterals challenged by the fluidity of national interests entertained by great and middle powers? Uh, Matthew, I know you, 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 you also focus on Australian foreign policy and security, so please take it away. Um, does it challenge the Quad? Does it challenge minilateralism? Um, look, uh, to some extent, but then the Quad is, of course, you know, done for a specific purpose. The, the Quad, notionally, is something that has an Indo-Pacific focus. So what happens between Ukraine and Russia, in theory at least, shouldn't affect, it in the, the, the slightest, the agenda of the Quad. Um, that said, of course, there is a fair bit of irritation, as uh, as Bryce pointed out, that uh, you know India chose to uh, to adopt what was fairly tough language in uh, their statement, uh, but uh, then the uh, relatively weak word abstain uh, when it came to uh, to the Ukraine issue. Uh, I think we need to be very careful in assuming that uh, minilateral groupings will always be on the same page at the same time. And I know Bill has uh, has written about this very much in terms of uh, an alliance context um, in relation to the purpose and expectation of alliances. You know, you have them for a specific purpose and you need to have the right expectations of them. There's no use in thinking that the Quad can go off and, uh, you know, represent democratic values or be part of a democratic security diamond in a global context. That's just rhetoric. Ultimately, what India is in the quad for is its position with respect to Chinese interests or its, its, its own interests. So I think um, that's the, that's the uh, you know, not very good answer there. Um, does, on the broader question of does the conflict with Ukraine mean that we have to rethink deterrence? What deters? Um, look, I, I am not someone who in uh, the past has, has looked too much at individual psychology and agency and, and nationalism. But in the case of Putin, uh, I'm not sure the man is deterrable. Um, every time he has uh, been presented with an opportunity to do something, he has taken it. Brinkmanship is, is uh, very much in his calculus. So too, I think, has been his desire to uh, basically obtain escalation dominance over the United States that uh, he has made the assumption for a long time now that his risk appetite is higher uh, than the United States, that the United States will not risk war. Um, that may not be the case, um, but it may ultimately be, uh, still be the case. And this is what worries me about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Maria's um, sort of nightmare scenario, that if this keeps going on, then Putin may well say, OK, I will detonate a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Or guess what? I'll detonate one in the North Sea. Or I'll uh, shoot down a couple of NATO fighters, um, you know, by accident. Let's really see what, you know, the West's escalation ladder looks like. Um, and uh, so I think when dealing uh, with, uh, with Putin, um, ultimately uh, what deters is not probably what we think deters uh, or the full suite of things that we think deters. So certainly diplomacy doesn't, the threat of economic sanctions doesn't, the threat of uh, you know, incorporating Ukrainian security structures doesn't, 
Uh, about the only thing I think before the crisis that would have worked would have been about 60,000 troops in Ukraine um, and uh, to deter Putin. And obviously that wasn't going to happen. Okay, Maria, as someone who focuses on the psychology of de de deterrence, do you have anything to say to that? Yes, I, just something very quickly, because I know we're approaching the end of our session. Um, what I'd like to say is some people are saying, does this sort of spell the end of the quad or are people going to lose faith in sort of these mini laterals, you know, against China? And my answer is, Absolutely not. It's going to strengthen them because the real winner from this is China, because, you know, Russia is going to have to turn to China for a number of things, um, which is going to increase China's leverage, which is going to make, you know, countries in the region even more concerned about, um, you know, getting together to come up with defenses against China. So it's not a it's not a theoretical question, the theoretical answer to Bill's question, but I think empirically, we're going to see these grouping. Yes, there's momentary irritation, but that will, people will get over it as China's power increases. Okay, thank you very much. And as Maria has uh, so kindly uh, uh, indicated, it is the end of our session. Um, as I said, this is an unfolding situation and I'm sure the AIIA will be keeping its eye on it. Um, I'm currently putting together a panel on um, the, um, the consequences of this for the EU and NATO, um, which um, is or should be by now, or at least by tonight, um, on our website, that's international affairs org.au with some friends um, in Europe next week on Friday. I know other branches um, of the or branches of the AIIA are putting together their own events. Um, so um, if you want to engage more in the discussion on this topic, but not just this topic, of course, because we cover the whole world, um, please do come along to the AIIA, sign up as a member. Um, and um, come and join us, come and join the, the biggest, I guess, discussion on international affairs in Australia. But for now, I want to thank you all for joining us. And I want to thank my guests, uh, Matt Sussex, Ben Zala, and Maria Ross Rubley. And I hope I see you all soon. Well, I, I, I got used to saying, I hope I see you all in person soon. Um, and now we can actually do it. So let's do it. So see you very soon. Good night. Uh, goodbye, everybody. <clears throat>